welcome to Biblical Genetics. This is episode two. I'm your host, Dr. C, coming at you from Tears of Zion near uh, Denver, Colorado. It's just a beautiful location. Up here, there's hardly any people. Here's a little bit of road traffic in the background, but I love nature and I love uh, coming out and just talking about the beauty of God's creation and being able to be in it. So here I am. We're not talking about nature today. We're talking about something that's mysterious to most people. Something that science has just figured out. But most people, when you say something like gene sequencing or genome, their eyes just kind of glaze over. So I want to unpack that for you. I want to unravel this mystery and show you um, some of the amazing things that we're now able to do with our new technologies. First, you can't sequence DNA unless you steal some, oh, let's call them proteins from bacteria. They're called polymerases. Bacterial polymerases, when you add them to a solution with DNA and, and some energy sources, they will make copies of the DNA. Well, bacterial polymerases are actually at the backbone of our entire modern genomics revolution. They do all the work and we need them. So we've harnessed them. And what we do is we add them to a solution and we run a cycle of temperature up and down and up and down that starts and stops the reaction, starts and stops the reaction, starts and stops the reaction. And what it does is first you make one copy of your DNA. Now you have two. And then a second run, now it makes copies of your two. Now you have four. And a third run, now you have eight. And then 16, 32, and you amplify your DNA until you get a lot of pieces of DNA. All right, simple enough. But how do we sequence it? Well, sequencing is tricky. A lot of different ways to do it. Back in the day when I was doing it, we would run this PCR reaction and then just stop it in the middle. And when we stopped it, what would happen was we'd have all these pieces of DNA of different lengths. And then we put it in this giant gel, which is a couple of feet long. We'd stick it in the top and we'd run electricity through it. And because DNA is a polar molecule, it, it migrates through the gel in one direction. And at the bottom of the gel, we had a little laser. And the laser would be um, looking for colors. What I didn't tell you is when we ran a PCR, uh, the end of the DNA molecules were tagged, depending on if it was an A, T, G, or C, with uh, one of several fluorescent molecules. So when the DNA reached the end, the laser would say blue, red, green, blue, blue, yellow, uh, yellow, orange, whatever the four colors were. It was just in a sequence of blue, 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 green, green, blue, orange, orange, red, yellow, 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 blue. And then the computer would say, oh, that's A, T, T, G, C, C, A, 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 T, G, C, C, A. And that's the gene sequence. Works great, worked beautiful. It was fantastic, but it was really laborious. I'm so glad that we can now take DNA samples and send them to laboratory and they can do it for us for cheap. Okay, so that's how you make uh, a sequence of DNA. What's a genome? Well, a genome is all of your DNA, all of your genes together. You've got about uh, three billion letters in your genome. Actually, you have two copies, one from your mother, one from your father. So you have six billion letters of DNA in each cell. The PCR, that reaction works best at about 300 letters. So it makes a copy of about 300 letters, works great. You can't do three billion with it. So what you do is you do what you, what's called shotgun sequencing. You just sequence the whole genome in little bits and pieces. And you've got millions and millions and millions of these little pieces, and then you line them up to build the genome. But you can't just line them end to end, you have to overlap them. And here's, the, here's the, where, where the tricky part comes in. Let me give you an example. Let's say you wanted to um, read the Bible or recreate the Bible by taking the Bible and cutting all, the, all sentences out at random, words and sentences, and so you, got, you have thousands of these little teeny pieces of paper with words on them. And you want to rebuild the Bible. You could never do it. It's not the time problem. It's the fact that if you only have one copy of it, you don't know if this sentence follows that sentence or this word follows that word. What you need is you need to take a whole bunch of Bibles, like 20 of them, cut them all up at random. And now you have a time problem because the human mind would, you in your lifetime would never be able to assemble it. But if you read those sequences into a computer, the computer, this massive calculator that we've built, can find all the overlapping segments. So you might have, um, in the beginning was the Word. And you might have, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, those two things in our Bibles would come one after the other, but you need a piece that overlaps. So maybe you find a piece that says, was the Word and the Word. Ah, and then you can bridge those two things and now you can string them together and piece by piece by piece you can build that genome so that all three billion letters of your DNA are figured out. Okay, but it's a massive problem. 
Because if you did it letter for letter, your genome would take about 850 Bibles. So if you wanted to do this sequence, sequencing on the Bible, you'd need like 850 times 20 or 30 to get a really good, robust sequence of all those words in there. That's massive. And that's why we have computers to do all this work for us. Okay. DNA polymerases do the copying. Computers do the assembling after we run this thing called a polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And that is beautiful. That's how it works. You, another thing I also said, you need multiple copies so that all the pieces, you can overlap them and build a genome. Let me give you a secret. When they first did the human genome, they did exactly that. But the next logical thing to do was the chimpanzee genome. And they didn't want to spend $3 billion on it. So they cheaped out. Yeah, they, they assumed chimpanzees and humans have common ancestry without actually testing it. And they very lightly sequenced the chimpanzee genome. And they took those pieces and they lined it up on the human genome. Voila, we had a bunch of garbage. In fact, the human genome, there's places that we could not sequence, highly repetitive places we couldn't sequence. There was about 300 gaps in the human genome. In the centromeres, the middle of the chromosomes, the telomeres at the end of the chromosomes is very repetitive DNA, and a couple of places in the middle of a chromosome where it was really hard to sequence it. Okay. When they assembled the chimpanzee genome, they had over 300,000 gaps. In fact, it was garbage. It was a debacle of science. They should never have done it. They should have waited until they had some more money to do it right. Now, we've redone it since then, but it took over a decade to correct it. And science was held back as we're waiting for a, for a real chimpanzee genome sequence. In some future episode, we'll be talking about the differences between humans and chimpanzees. Save it. I just gave you a little teaser there. All right. So now we have the ability to sequence genomes. And now we have the ability to sequence lots of genomes. That first genome cost the government $3 billion. Well, the US government has launched the Million Genomes Project. They're gonna sequence one million genomes for about the same price as they sequenced the first one. That's how much the, the technology has advanced over the last 20 years. In fact, it's um, literally a million times cheaper to sequence DNA today than it was just a little while ago. That's crazy. And that's changing everything because now we have DNA from thousands of people, soon to be millions of people from around the world. And those ancestry testing companies, they've got millions of people on their own. But the way they do it's a little different. You see, there's no purpose in sequencing the entire genome for most purposes. Most of the genome is exactly the same across everyone. So I'm at like 90, 99%, I don't know what the percentage is, a huge percent of the genome, it's 100% invariant, why do you want to sequence that? If you're trying to tell the difference between two people, just look at the places that differ. So what they do is this. They take what's called a, um, a SNP chip. Ooh, SNP, S-N-P. Single nucleotide polymorphism. Ooh, science, big words. Polymorphism is a difference you find between people. And what they do is they find a bunch of these that, um, that separate one person from another, one people group from another. They're called ancestry informative markers. They also use some um, medically important markers and some markers that affect your skin color, your eye color, and things like that. And what they do is they take this little piece of DNA and they put a little drop of water on a, a glass slide and they put millions of them on a glass slide. In fact, ancestry.com, they, they sequence, uh, I think, um, like 900,000 letters, letters that vary between people and they're able to tell all this amazingly cool stuff. So now we are we're washing data. We have so much data, we don't even hardly know what to do with it. And now with all that data, we can begin to test theories of history. The Bible claims to be a book of history. Genetics can test theories of history. What do you think is gonna happen? Stay tuned. This is Dr. C for Biblical Genetics. If you'd like to support us, click the link, go to biblicalgenx.com. You can find out how to do it. But for now, signing off.